Good afternoon. You're here with us on Likeable Science here in the Think Tech Studios in Pioneer Plaza. My guest today is Dr. Dan Rubinoff from the University of Hawaii. He's a uh, entomologist in the Department of Plant and Environmental Protection, I believe. That's correct. Welcome, Dan. Thank you How for you having doing? me. Very good. I'm excited to be here. Good. Dan's uh, passion is bugs, as you might have gathered from the title. We're going to be talking about bugs, bugs of all sorts, particularly Hawaiian bugs. Uh, and we're going to cover uh, several different aspects of bugs. It's a big topic. There's, there's lots and lots of insects around. It right? is the, some of the smallest organisms, but the biggest topic, I would say. <laughs> very nice, very nice. Excellent. Uh, let me just uh, introduce Dan a little bit. He, he's, a, he's a member of the graduate faculty there in, this, in that program. He's also the director of the University of Hawaii Insect Museum and uh, has uh, his doctorate from, uh, I believe, University of California at Berkeley, with his undergraduate degree from uh, Cornell. And Dan works in systematics, which we'll get into a little bit later about, about what, what all is in systematics. And, um, but we'll just jump right on into this. So why bugs? You know, what, what, what's the deal? Why are you, why are you right, I start with bugs? It's, a, it's actually sort of an odd story. Uh, I grew up in Berkeley, California, which is a cold, foggy place. And I was originally interested in snakes and lizards and amphibians. But that's actually a horrible place for them. There's, there's very few of them there. And it turns out it's also a horrible place for insects, but because it's cold and foggy and, and a bit dry. Uh, but there were at least more insects than there were snakes and amphibians. And so I started, uh, I took a bugology class in middle school and I just got hooked because instead of going outside and spending all day looking for snakes and never finding anything, I could go outside and actually find insects in my yard. And that was incredibly exciting. Ah, excellent. I, I, I empathize the, the ability to actually Grab hold of the thing you you're, want to study is, is great. It's why I never like studying birds. You know, right. They're always at a distance. You know. Immensely frustrating. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. But why, uh, sort of on a, on a bigger picture, why should people, sort of people at large, care about uh, insects? What do they do for us other than fly around and annoy us? E.O. Wilson, uh, uh, professor emeritus at Harvard, had uh, an interesting image uh, that he liked to suggest, which was that if you took everything else off the planet, except for insects, you would still have an image of the planet remaining. They are that abundant and that important in every terrestrial ecosystem that uh, it's almost like they should be asking, what are we good for? Because they're doing all the work, all the processing, and, and we're just lingering around as some sort of peripheral item. Right, right. I mean, certainly it's clear, for instance, bees, the pollination, huge impacts on our crops. And that's, I gather, quite, a, quite an issue in terms of our Bee populations are declining, so right, right. Uh, that's some some real worry. Uh, beyond that, I mean, butterflies sort of flitting around are, are, all, right. are all very nice, but yeah, realistically, what what sort of services are they providing us? Right, right. They, quite frankly, do everything. All of the I, I shouldn't say they do it in their, its entirety, but they are the decomposers, they are the scavengers. Uh, think of all the I hate to say it this way, but the the dead things around. And we think it's disgusting that they're there, but there are flies and there are beetles that are specialized to go in and decompose these rather unsightly things and turn them into nutrients. We have other insects that are essential to plants in ways beyond pollination. They are uh, essentially allowing the diversity of plants that we have to exist, not just in terms of pollination, but by keeping some plants down. Uh, they're extremely important in basically every life cycle that goes on on t in terrestrial areas of this planet. And it would take weeks to fully explain how important they are in each system. So, so the short answer is they literally are the predators, they're the prey, there are pests, they are our answer to the pests, they are the, the things that bear the diseases that kill us, but also uh, in some ways are the things that control the diseases that kill us. Uh, for example, uh, mosquitoes are really significant. They, they kill more people than any other insect, right? But there are also mosquitoes that are cannibals that eat the mosquitoes that do that to us. And so, again, you know, it becomes an incredibly complex uh, question to answer. And that's something we're still working on. And, and as we work on it, we find more and more reasons that, that our ecosystems are inexorably tied to, to insects. Yeah, so, and it's frightening because we hear of some of the changes in insect populations that may be reflecting larger scale underlying changes even. Uh, the monarch butterflies, I guess, hit a historic low population in Mexico this winter. Right. And I gather now the uh, 
ladybugs are being, uh, at least across the U.S., is being invaded by one imported species is now exactly. essentially taking over all the habitats and basically taking over from all the different species of ladybugs. Right, we're losing our diversity of ladybugs, yeah. we're also losing our diversity of bumblebees, and that's a major concern right now. A lot of bumblebees that were common even 20 years ago are virtually gone or extinct from large parts of their range. And in and of itself, each one of these examples may just be, oh, why do I care about bumblebees? Why do you care about ladybugs? One or another, does it matter? But the fact is, things are happening that we don't understand. These are changes that we are not in charge of, and the ramifications of them could be quite serious. If, for example, this diversity of ladybug species was good at suppressing aphid populations, and aphids are insects that transmit plant diseases that wipe out crops, they're an incredibly important pest. Ladybugs are often brought into places specifically to control them. But if you have a diversity of ladybugs, you have a diversity of, of weapons to fight these different species of aphid. If one ladybug comes over and takes care of all the other ladybug species, wipes them all out, suddenly we have one weapon that may not be a very good uh, way to combat all these different aphid species. And so suddenly we'll have pests where we never had them in situations that really affect us, not just in our pocketbook, but in our stomach. Hmm. Interesting. This is, this is oddly reminiscent of my uh, talk, my guest last week, who was talking about coral. And yeah. in essence, it sounds like we're doing sort of the same kind of thing, this inadvertent sort of geoengineering experiments without any real clue as to the outcome. Yeah, and no controls, right. which is the really bad part about it. So right. we don't know even what, what would have happened otherwise. Yeah. <clears throat> exactly, exactly. So um, tell me a little bit, though, lo let's, get, let's get local here about this. Uh, you work on conservation of the Kamehameha butterfly, and, and so I know very little about that. Can you tell me a little bit about sort of uh, populations are dropping dramatically, or they, what's their status? Sure. Uh, I, this is in collaboration, and really the project director of that is uh, Dr. Will Haynes, my former student. And together we're looking at uh, what's going on with that butterfly in part because it's our state insect and it's an iconic insect in Hawaii. It, we only have two native butterflies and it's one of them. Uh, and we know it's declining. We have records in uh, our University of Hawaii Insect Museum and other insect museums around the state. And uh, they demonstrate that this Kamehameha butterfly used to be in places like Tantalus, Waimanalo, Hilo Bay, and uh, even 20 years ago, in the 1990s, it was found there, and it's gone from those places, utterly gone. And that, to me, is the beginning of a bad trend. And we've seen that trend in Hawaii so many times with plants, with the native honey creepers, uh, and with many other insects. And to start to see this with our state insect is very concerning. Uh, we'd like to get ahead of that and try to understand what is causing its decline before it's too late, before we're scraping together little remnant populations on a few uh, scattered mountains. Uh, this butterfly is still found on every island uh, of, the, of the main islands, but uh, it's not found in every place that it used to be. So we want to find out where it is, and from that we should be able to extrapolate what's causing its decline and do something about it. Oh, so, so you're in the very the sort of the basic research phase of this conservation work right now. Just, just starting. Just, just, just trying starting. to figure out what the factors are. Realizing there's a problem right. and uh, and trying to address it, and we've asked for the public's help with that uh, to send us pictures when they find them of the Kamehameha butterfly, and they can send them to kamehamehabutterfly.com, and uh, we'll look at those pictures and tell you whether or not you found a uh, Kamehameha butterfly and add the data points to a real scientific data set that we're using. So. This is a direct example of citizen science where the public can help us. Excellent, excellent. I hope, I hope people hear that. That's, that's a great way to contribute, to, to get involved in science, is if you see what you think may be a Kamehameha butterfly, take a picture of it with your cell phone and send it off to kamehamehabutterfly.com. You said, right. okay. And uh, you, you, you too can then contribute to science. Excellent. Um, so the... Uh, how, how do we have estimates on the population of the Kamehameha at this point? No, no. Really? no. And, and in fact, to be totally honest, it's very difficult to get estimates of insect populations, especially wild insect populations, unless they're incredibly restricted to certain areas. And that's because insects, just by their nature, tend to have uh, boom and bust periods that are normally part of their cycle um, in ways that we wouldn't relate to as vertebrates. Um, maybe mice, where you see tons and tons of mice one year and then they disappear the next year and then they slowly build up and come back. That's how most insect populations operate. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to do is suss out these normal cycles from something that's actually a crash. Uh -huh. Okay, well excellent. And so how does your work with the insect museum fit into this then? 
So the University of Hawaii Insect Museum was uh, founded in about the same time as, as the College of Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources. And what it is is essentially a snapshot over time of insect populations, which is incredibly useful for understanding when insects, native insects go extinct, when invasive insects arrive, why some invasive insects arrive and disappear, and to track things like uh, the Kamehameha butterfly. If we didn't have insect museums, to tell us that, yeah, it's not hearsay, here's an actual specimen of the butterfly from Tantalus, it used to be there, that we wouldn't really know for sure. And in science, you can't work on hearsay. You have to work on the hard, cold facts, the, the specimens that you have before you. So museums are an essential part of that. And for example, the Kamehameha Project, but really any insect-based project relies on that history. It's our library. Oh, excellent. So are other, do you collaborate with other museums, the Bishop and all on this, or? Yes, in fact, uh, we've collaborated with uh, all the insect museums uh, in the state to ask them for their records of the Kamehameha butterfly, and that's been crucial to us getting an original picture and confirming, in fact, that there is a decline going on. Uh, okay. So yeah, with the Bishop Museum, the Hawaii Department of Agriculture, et cetera, there are lots of uh, little museums around. The Bishop, of course, is a massive one with over 14 million specimens. Excellent, excellent. So maybe, um, sort of skipping around a little bit here, T tell us what it is that a, system a systematist, I guess you would say, uh, does. Uh, again, a little bit of framework here. I get asked that question a lot. No. <laughs> so systematics is really just the study of relationships between organisms at any level. Uh, so uh, it's looking at the evolution of a group. You could call it uh, the relationships between populations, even the relationships uh, between individuals and populations. If you want to know um, how many bison carry cattle genes that have been interbred into them, you can use a systematic approach to understand that. If you want to understand how vertebrates evolved on the planet, you use systematics to understand that. So at every level, it's, it's using um, various forms of information to reconstruct an evolutionary history for the group. Uh -huh. And you choose the group, and you choose the level, and you choose the, the, the data that you use. Most often now we use DNA data. Sure, right. That seems like that's the big thing is people are constructing all these fancy family trees, as it were, exactly. based exactly. now on DNA data, where it used to be based on suites of characteristics, basically. Exactly. Morphological exactly. characteristics, yes, okay. Excellent. Well, that's, uh, that's certainly a, a, a critical piece of, again, building that evidence base so you'll know where you know sort of what your problems are, what, what, what your next challenges are to take on. Yeah, and, and systematists and ecologists always rib each other about this sort of thing. I think systematics is the fundamental science uh, upon which ecology is based, and they, of course, would disagree. <laughs> and uh, it's an ugly argument. I won't go into it here. <laughs> well, excellent. We, we, we won't get into that fight here. <laughs> uh, and we're going to take a little break here. I'm Ethan Allen, your host on Likeable Science. We're talking with Dan Rubinoff from the University of Hawaii and we'll be back shortly. I'm Hong Jiang, host for Asia In Review on Tuesdays. And I'm David Day, host for Asian Review on Thursdays. Both of us broadcast our respective shows at 4 p.m. And my topics tend to deal with uh, questions related to environment, culture, history, and sometimes human rights. And my shows tend to be on international business, foreign policy, geopolitics, and national security. And you can watch our shows live on the ThinkTech website at thinktechhawaii.com. And uh, you can also watch us on YouTube or Olalo. So come join us on Thursdays at 4 p.m. I'm David Day. And on Tuesdays at 4 p.m., I'm Hong Jiang. Aloha. Aloha. And we're back with Likeable Science. I'm Ethan Allen. My guest is Dan Rubinoff from the University of Hawaii, uh, an entomologist and uh, systematist from the university they are. So Dan, tell me this. I'm, I'm really intrigued by one particular thing you sent me earlier. <laughs> you sent me some movies of the carnivorous caterpillars. So tell me first a little bit about the carnivorous caterpillars, then we'll, let's take a look at some here. Yeah, I brought uh, some videos that I think would be uh, gruesome and entertaining. Uh, so caterpillars overwhelmingly are vegetarian. Uh, everybody thinks of caterpillars eating leaves, and mm, the vast, vast majority of them do. In fact, 0.13% of all caterpillars on the planet are carnivorous. 0.13%. Not 13, not 1.3, 0.13. So a small, small, tiny, tiny fraction of the world's caterpillars are carnivorous, and we happen to have 
more than one in Hawaii. We happen to have two different radiations of carnivorous caterpillars in Hawaii. The odds of that would make Vegas tremble. <laughs> so it's a crazy, crazy sort of thing to have here. And uh, in fact, what we have uh, in Hawaii is even more special than that. It is the only caterpillar group on the planet that eats snails. So all the other caterpillars that are carnivorous, which is a fraction, 0.13%, they eat other insects. And in Hawaii, not only do we have caterpillars that eat other insects, we also have a group that eats snails, and that's unheard of anywhere else. Wow. Let's let's see if we can pull up some movies here. Uh, our control room can maybe uh, pop up a movie here, and, and we'll see if we can, uh, Dan can tell us what's going on in it here. I'd be happy to narrate the carnage. <laughs> So actually in this case, and this was another crazy discovery, we have uh, a cannibal caterpillar. So the bottom larger one is a hyposmacoma caterpillar that we call carnivora, that's the name we gave it, uh, and it is eating one of its brethren, a candy wrapper cased hyposmacoma, which is hiding it in its case, the whiter case. Uh, and this is also unrecorded. There are no caterpillars on the planet that specialize in eating other caterpillars. Some will eat other caterpillars, but here what you're seeing is the larger caterpillar chewing through the hole, a hole through the house of the other caterpillar, and then he's going to crawl inside there and eat the other caterpillar alive in its own home. And you can see there's the other caterpillar's head trying to fight off this uh, carnivorous caterpillar as it chews through the case, but it will be to no avail because these carnivorous caterpillars know what they're doing. And now he's climbing inside the little caterpillar's case. Again, the white case is the little caterpillar. The darker case with uh, sand on it is the carnivorous caterpillar. He has now entered the case of the little caterpillar and is eating him inside there. This occurs nowhere else on the planet. Uh, it's shocking, I know. <laughs> remarkably gruesome. Remarkably yes, gruesome. Yes, I, I can't watch myself. That's, uh, <laughs> that's, no, that, that's really amazing. Uh, and it's, it's stunning that, as you say, here in Hawaii, we're seeing such unusual things in terms of a, 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 a caterpillar eating another caterpillar, which right. is carnivory is, is rare, cannibalism is even rarer. So. Right, and, and to specialize right. in cannibalism. Yes. These caterpillars do not eat leaves. Uh -huh. If you give them leaves, they'll starve. If you give them related species of caterpillar, they'll eat them and be happy. Uh -huh. And okay. that's, that's just not right. <laughs> that, that's great, that's wonderful. The, the other movie that I even thought was <clears throat> perhaps more interesting that you had was the, the uh, snail eaters. Ah, uh, yes, and now we have the famous snail eaters. Right, right, I think that's up yeah. now. Great, great. And here we can see uh, a similar looking long white cased uh, caterpillar. And again, the caterpillar is inside this case. It's spun of silk, and that's its home. And it is found at Tornatolides snail, which is a native a group of snails in Hawaii. And it is sneaking up on it and spinning, as you can see here, silk much like in Gulliver's Travels, uh, these are, I guess, are the lilliputs, the caterpillars are, sneaking up on a sleeping snail and spinning it down onto the leaf. And here you can see another example of that. That's a snail that's waking up and the caterpillar's already started to spin the silk to hold it down onto the leaf. The snail, as you'll see, will try to escape, try to put its foot out, but the silk will hold it and it will give up. These caterpillars are not aggressive. And there you can see the snail's trying to get out and it can't. The snail, the caterpillars are very patient. They'll wait for the snail to go back into its shell as it's doing now. And again, the snail thinks it's safe by doing that. That's the snail's great mistake. Uh, the caterpillar now comes back across over the snail and will enter the shell and eat the snail alive in its own shell. And again, that whole behavior is remarkable and unprecedented. We don't see this anywhere else on the planet. Uh, and here you can see the caterpillars inside the snail's shell. Uh, the snail is retreated as far back as it can, and the snail is actually being eaten, if you can see through the shell. And these caterpillars will attack snails much larger than themselves. Here you can see a much larger succinaid snail with a smaller caterpillar on the side. That's that's absolutely astounding. <laughs> I'm glad you agree. <laughs> no, I mean you, you don't think of, of insects as sort of eating higher life forms, as it were, or or, or, <laughs> uh -oh, yeah. or no. big, bigger life forms. Right, right. Uh, you know, may, maybe they bite us, maybe they sting us, but right. they don't they don't actually chew down and chop down on us and and, and you know feast on our flesh, as it were. And, and well, not when we're alive. <laughs> right. right. Yes, exactly. There's right. a whole forensic entomology right. field. Yeah, you're right. right. So uh, that's uh, that's pretty amazing. That's that's 
Uh, it is, it is uh, unprecedented. Yeah. And it's something about Hawaii that has promoted these sorts of novel evolutionary experiments that we see nowhere else on the planet, and, and that's pretty cool. Speaking of novel experiments, uh, you were telling me a little bit about another novel uh, experiment with a hyposcoma. Hyposmacoma, right? That's this Hyposmacoma moth, yes. Yeah. Uh, being amphibious. Right. So, so the right. caterpillars can live either on land or in the water, can right. move back and forth. So hyposmacoma is uh, an incredibly diverse genus. It's only found in Hawaii, but there are over 400 species here. and. Amongst them, there are the usual leaf eaters, they're the usual ones that are eating uh, lichen, the sort of things that you see elsewhere on the planet. And then as we saw, there are these unusual groups that have radiated and attack snails, and other ones that are related to them that attack other hyposmacoma, the leaf eating ones. Uh, these are carnivores that attack the leaf eating ones. And then what we found also is this incredible group within hyposmacoma of perhaps uh, 15 or 20 species that are amphibious. That is, they'll go into the water. And uh, that is still rare, less rare than carnivory. 2% of the world's caterpillars are aquatic. So still not great odds that Hawaii would have one by chance. 2% uh, of the world's caterpillars are aquatic. We have a radiation of them here. In fact, we have several radiations of them within hyposmacoma we've discovered, which is incredibly, again, those Vegas odds keep, keep going against us and we keep winning. Uh, we want not only one radiation, but three independent radiations of aquatic caterpillars. And most of the planet has very, very few of them, and hyposmacoma has given us several radiations of them. So that's pretty neat. What makes them unique is that everywhere else, when you have an aquatic caterpillar, it's committed to being aquatic. So it has gills, they live underwater, you take them out and they're like a fish out of water, they'll die. These guys in Hawaii can be underwater for weeks at a time, or we can rear them in a dry Petri dish or on a dry rock and they're perfectly happy. And that, again, is unprecedented. So the, the same caterpillar, can you could have it underwater for a part of its lifespan and then haul out and dry it out and it's perfectly happy, basically? And it'll finish the rest of its lifespan and turn into a moth. And that's, oh, that's crazy. Yeah. Try that with a goldfish or a cat, you know? <laughs> It's not nice. Don't. No. <laughs> no, that's that's again. This is this is stunning. So, what is it about Hawaii? Is it, is it Hawaii, or is it just sort of uh, an island, sort of an island phenomena that that uh, has driven this kind of wild radiation of species? So Hawaii is uh, really the American Galapagos. And people always talk about how incredible the Galapagos are, and they have nothing on Hawaii, and especially nothing on Hawaii before people got here. Um, you know, we have this effect everywhere we go. When we arrive, lots of things go extinct. But Hawaii uh, was is more climatologically diverse than the Galapagos. It's bigger in size. There are more islands. So it generated this fantastic array of diversity and, and radiation of species in all sorts of groups if they made it here. Uh, we don't know exactly why. That's the, the $100 million career question, is if we can figure out exactly what it is about Hawaii that has made a few of these groups do such crazy outlandish things that we see nowhere else, that would be a, a major discovery in science. We do think, I do think, I should say, that it has something to do with having the right template, that is the right group get here, in this case a tiny hyposmacoma moth arriving, and being flexible in its abilities, uh, and then having uh, a lot of empty space for it to exploit. There are no social insects here, so no wasps, no ants are native in Hawaii. So if you come to a place like that, 10 million years ago, 15 million years ago, there's a lot more room to try things that would fail in a continental cli uh, situation. And so, in a way, Hawaii has been more permissive to these experiments and, and let them go further than they would perhaps anywhere else. Uh, most, most intriguing, yes. I, I, I see what you're saying, but uh, an open ecosystem, basically, with lots, yeah. of, lots of niches available, sort of, that it could be... That weren't filled right, uh, in the be, same ways. Right, could yeah. be tried, and, and at least some of which would, would work, yeah. Right. yeah. It's, yeah, it's intriguing. You had uh, <coughs> sent along some, some pictures illustrating a little bit of your work. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe we could look at some of those now. I'd love to take you through them. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Okay. Here's, here's the first one. Maybe just a brief word or two about, about these? Yeah. Maybe. It's just a reminder that uh, we think of Hawaii, we think of the, the main islands, which are between uh, half a million and five million years old. And that's the big island to Kauai. And you can see that in the red line there. And those are the big islands. Uh, uh, basaltic islands that, that rise several thousand feet above sea level. But a long time ago, we had a, a range of islands like Nihoa, Necker, that used to be over the hotspot um, and were very large in and of themselves. In fact, Gardner Pinnacle, which now is just a sea stack, 
used to be, people think, 9,000 feet tall when it was over the Big Island. And if we go back in time, say 10 million years, when those islands were bigger, they served as the, the colonizing hotspots for a lot of the species that we see today. And these species have then hopped down the islands to, to the islands that are here today. But the lineages are older than the islands they live on. And we always think uh, old as dirt is kind of a thing, but you could really say old as hyposmacoma, and, and that would be even older than dirt. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Let's see. And this is just a, a picture people often uh, talk about the butterflies in Hawaii. These are the two native butterflies, the Kamehameha butterfly on the left and uh, Blackburn's blue on the right. And uh, that one is doing a bit better, Blackburn's blue. It feeds on Aali'i and Koa, and you can still see it around uh, quite a bit. Oh, well, that, that's, that's good. Then the Kamehameha on the left there is uh, something that our viewers might want to keep their eyes out for if you see something looks like this. By all means, snap a picture of it and send it back to Kamehamehabutterfly.com, and uh, you'll be contributing to the, the betterment of science. It is interesting. I was talking to somebody who grew up in Hawaii, and they said they've never seen one of these. Yeah, uh, and that's so, a shame. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Let's see. Uh, and this is just uh, an example, uh, just to remind folks, Hyposmacoma has 400 species, and these carnivorous and cannibalistic ones and aquatic ones are just small <laughs> segments of a much greater <laughs> diversity that the group has. So what you're seeing here is Hyposmacoma lignivora, the giant of the group, and the smallest one, Elegantula, uh, in the lower right. So there's a lot of size diversity and ecological diversity in this group. It's incredibly interesting, not just for the carnivorous and the aquatic ones. Those are the flashy guys, but there are lots of other species in this group that do really interesting things. Yeah, that's uh, several orders of magnitude in, Isn't it? in yeah. body size. And yeah, that's, yeah. that's amazing to have that within a single genus. And here's just another example of the diversity that you see in hyposmacoma. This is an example of the diversity in the cases. Each one of those pictures represents a different case type. And each case type represents a slew of species. So that one on the far left, uh, the biggest one, is Lignivora, the moth that you saw in the picture before, the largest of the hyposmacoma. But it has relatives that are a related species on each island. Lignivora is, say, uh, endemic to Oahu, but Kauai, Molokai, Maui, Big Island, each have a species like Lignivora that are related to Lignivora. So that just gives you an example of how diverse this group is, and each one of those is a, a placeholder for many species of hyposmacoma. And these, these cases are... stage. These are the caterpillars, and what they're doing is spinning a case that they hide inside. And that's why if you look at some of those cases, you'll notice some of them are green because the caterpillar has found lichen, and it has attached that lichen to the case to camouflage itself, probably from birds. Other ones have these odd shapes. Even some of them will have mud on them and be really hard for us to find. And we're pretty sure that's because these caterpillars are hiding inside these cases, which has been part of their success. They're extremely difficult to find. And even if a bird gets really good at seeing one kind of case, it's not going to help it try and uh, find all these other different kinds of cases. So it's uh, exquisite camouflage. Yeah, interesting. And so, and these are actually then cases that the caterpillar, the active caterpillar, carries around. It's not like the cocoon or anything Absolutely. like that. Absolutely. It's, it's, yeah. it's more like a hermit crab in the yeah. sense that it's uh, oh. carrying it around. But unlike a hermit crab, oh, these caterpillars are making their own right. cases out oh. of silk and material that they find around them. Huh. Fascinating. I agree. I agree. I agree. <laughs> Let's see what's next here on picture is. Uh, this is just a, a reminder of how small they can be. Uh, we have a, an aquatic burrito-cased caterpillar case on the left. In the middle is the cone-cased caterpillar. And on the right, I'm going to ask you to guess. Uh, I wouldn't have a clue. It's a pencil. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a tip of a pencil. It's okay, a tip yes. of a pencil. Okay, you can see, see how small they are. Oh, I see. That's, Sorry to put you on the spot no, like that's that. that's fine. That's fine. That's, <laughs> no, that's a very vivid comparison then. Uh, yes, right, right. Exactly. Oh, those, are, those things are tiny. They are, they are, and that's part of the reason they probably have escaped a lot of people's notice. Right, indeed. And this is just a, a reminder about those aquatic uh, caterpillars. If you push the uh, uh, sequence there, you'll see that's a, a stream in Kauai, and this is what some of those aquatic caterpillars look like in action. You can see them feeding on moss and lichen. And if you uh, push it one more time, yeah, you can see one. There's one deep diving, crawling along underwater on a rock. And so if people don't believe me, if they think that ah, he's exaggerating, <laughs> on the left-hand side, you have some that are on dry land eating moss on a rock. On the left, you have one that's uh, scuba diving underwater. Uh, and they have to do that for extended periods because they're small and they crawl. They don't swim. 
So if you're underwater, you're underwater for a while. So how, how do they uh, breathe if you said they have no gills? We don't know yet, and we're working with a, a specialized caterpillar morphologist uh, from Denmark to try and figure out what's going on. We believe right now that it's direct gas exchange through the cuticle, through the skin, uh, but we can't be sure yet. If they're small enough, that could work. Exactly. That, that puts very strict limits on how big they can get. Exactly. And in fact, that puts limits on insects in general, but particularly for these guys. Uh, one uh, line of evidence that suggests that, though, is that these aquatic caterpillars are only found in what we call trout streams. And that's not because they have trout in them. It's because trout also rely on highly oxygenated, quickly moving water. And so these caterpillars, if you put them in a still tank, which I did the first time I caught some, it was so disappointing. I collected some from a NOAA stream, I, I took them home, I put them in a tub of water, and the next morning it smelled horrible, and they were all dead and rotting in the water. And it was over that sort of experiment that I realized they need moving water that's highly oxygenated. If we put them in a fish tank with a bubbler for two weeks, a month, they're happy as clams. But you can't have still water. They need that flowing water, that high oxygen content to survive underwater. Huh. Right. Yeah, that's how experiments, yeah. I mean, science advances, right? Exactly. Is these trial and error. <laughs> exactly. Some are a little sad. Right. T tough on the initial. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> the first volunteer. Right. <laughs> and this is just uh, some more examples of the snail eating caterpillars. If you didn't get enough before, here's a real picture of uh, Molluscavora, Hyposmacoma molluscavora, eating a Tornatolidae snail inside its own home. And you can really enjoy and appreciate uh, how the caterpillar spun the snail down and is inside there eating it alive. And in a second, if you flip now, you'll see the bloodthirsty eye of the adult Hyposmacoma molluscavora, and there she is, the bloodthirsty red eye. For some reason, they are the only Hyposmacoma with red eyes, or these carnivore ones. And it's got to be coincidence, but it's a delightful <laughs> one, isn't it? Doesn't it look ferocious? Yes, indeed, indeed. In all its minutia. <laughs> And this is just a reminder, you know, uh, we're not strolling along the beach uh, plucking things out of the air. Uh, a lot of the work we do is in some pretty uh, rough conditions and unpleasant places. That is not a stream, that is a trail on Molokai in the Kamako Preserve. And uh, that's how it is some days. We're just in downpours, uh, creeping around in the rainforest, looking under leaves to try and make these kinds of discoveries. And there are a lot of folks from uh, too many agencies to mention in the state and federal government that have helped us and continue to help us by sending us stuff. Uh, so we really appreciate that, because it's not easy field work a lot of the time. Excellent. And this is just a, a reminder, if you click on this one again, uh, this is what science looks like. Uh, and I only include this slide because sometimes people think that uh, when I say something about relationships or the evolution of a group, it's, it's an opinion or an educated guess. And in fact, it's not. It's really about uh, doing some hardcore work, statistical analyses, and constructing figures like this, which this is essentially a family tree. We all have them for our, maybe our, our families. This is how you do it for a group like Hyposmacoma. And that's based on a bunch of uh, thousands of base pairs of DNA sequence that we've gotten from each and every one of these samples, constructed together and uh, analyzed in a systematic software package, computer packages, that are designed to understand the different relationships and model the relationships between the DNA sequence to produce uh, a tree like this that helps us understand how they evolve. So just for folks at home to understand that there is hard science behind this and the technology involved in doing this kind of work. Part of the fun is going out and, and finding the insects in their habitat, and then there's a lot of lab work and a lot of computer work to understand the relationships. Right, because you've got to be able to say, even if you see the same characteristic, it could have arisen through sort of convergent evolution. Exactly, it could be coincidence. Because of the same conditions rather than because of a shared ancestry. Exactly, for example, penguins are dark on the top and light on the bottom, and so are killer whales, but nobody would say they're related. It's because they both swim in the ocean, and there's an advantage to being light on the bottom and dark on the top. Exactly. So we have to protect against that to truly understand how these relationships right. that, are. That's what this is, is trying yeah, to get sure. it unambiguously. Exactly, exactly. See, I'm not sure. And this, uh, what, one neat thing about that when you do this, and this highlights that, is we discovered that there are two kinds of hyposmacoma, some with two openings on their cases and some with one opening on their case. And this shows that the ones that have one opening on their case are in fact all closely related to each other and distinct from the two opening case types. So that's a sign that this is a major evolutionary uh, thing. We don't know why and we don't know how it evolved, but uh, it, it's a clue to us that we need to investigate this further because it's pretty important to these moths, mm -hmm. even though we didn't think it was important at all. Hmm. I see.
And this is just another example of uh, those phylogenies. In this case, it's demonstrating proof that those aquatic caterpillars have evolved multiple different times in Hawaii. So again, catap aquatic caterpillars are 2% in the world. In Hawaii, we have multiple examples of that that are not related to each other very closely. So that's pretty oh. remarkable. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Huh. Now, I guess that's it for the slides. Oh, but, good. Uh, that, was, that was great. Uh, so why don't we take another little break right now? Uh, again, I'm Ethan Allen. You're here on Likeable Science. I've got my guest, Dan Rubinoff, from the University of Hawaii at Manoa here with me. And we'll be back shortly. I'm Hong Jiang, host for Asia in Review on Tuesdays. And I'm David Day, host for Asian Review on Thursdays. Both of us broadcast our respective shows at 4 p.m. And my topics tend to deal with uh, questions related to environment, culture, history, and sometimes human rights. And my shows tend to be on international business, foreign policy, geopolitics, and national security. And you can watch our shows live on the ThinkTech website at thinktechhawaii.com. And uh, you can also watch us on YouTube or Alalo. So come join us on Thursdays at 4 p.m. I'm David Day. And uh, on Tuesdays at 4 p.m., I'm Hong Jiang. Aloha. Aloha. And you're back here with Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. With me today in the studio is Dr. Dan Rubinoff from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, uh, entomologist, systematist. And we're talking about what bugs Hawaii today. <laughs> That's a well, new pun for me. I've heard a lot of insect puns, so thanks for that. <laughs> Dan's been sharing just some very intriguing examples of cannibalism in caterpillars and carnivory in caterpillars and caterpillars that can go underwater and up on land and all kinds of interesting stuff, as well as talking about the conservation of the Kamehameha butterfly, the Hawaii Insect Museum, all kinds of things. So Dan, you, you, it sounds like you do a lot of different work and, and you certainly must face a number of different challenges in, in the course of this. Uh, some of those have got, got to be sort of uh, scientific, technological, but what, what are some of your big challenges on that end right now? Oh, it's a, a, there's a, a great one coming on right now that's a, a very auspicious question. Um, we're entering an age of genomics, which I think most people have heard about, where rather than just uh, looking at little parts of genes, now the idea is to sequence an entire genome and to compare genomes between different things. Uh, we've done that for humans and for Neanderthals, for example, and discovered that humans carry Neanderthal genes. That was a major uh, epiphany that, for example, we, we've gotten to. Uh, Unfortunately, the, the state of genomic science for insects is not there yet, but that's what we're trying to work towards. If we can get to the point where we can sequence the genomes of these different insects and compare them effectively, that's going to be tremendous. Huh. Now, I, I've been hearing about that the big push these days is the so-called $1,000 genome, right? To yes. be able to, to, to sequence a genome for a thousand. Does it cost you $1,000 for every bug you want to? put through this process? <laughs> that wouldn't be bad, actually. That wouldn't be bad. That would be something that we can manage. And yeah, it's getting just about to that level right now where it's about $1,000. The problem is, uh, what do we do with the data once we get it? So we're very good right now at, at, at upping our, our technology and generating bigger and bigger chunks of the genome, more and more complete chunks of the genome. But what do we do with the data once we get it? And that's a challenge we have not met yet. Uh, different software packages are being developed to try and suss it out, but it's turning out to be much more complicated. So the answer to one question, as it always is in science, is leading to so many more questions, in fact. Right. So now there is sort of so much information that nobody can realistically go through it, make sense of it. It's like trying to drink it. out of a fire hose. Oh, exactly, exactly. Right. That's yeah. your, your data is just coming at you so fast, fast and, and, you, and you can't even handle uh, right. a, a fraction of it, right. really, at this stage. So again, but, but you're hoping for a, some sort of a, a technological assist in, in dealing with it's that. It's happening right now. I, I, I'm sure the next few years, genomes will be the standard for my science. But right now, we're, we're just in that stage where we're trying to figure out a way to, to do that. Excellent, excellent. Beyond, beyond that, you, I know you must face other challenges, too. Uh, you, you showed us that slide of uh, slogging along that, that wonderful, <laughs> what I thought was, was indeed a stream, and you pointed out it was not a stream, but was a trail. No, that was the trail, uh, yeah. <laughs> You should have seen the stream. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, I can't imagine that's sort of everyone's cup of tea to, to engage in that kind of work. Uh, so there must Absolutely. be some sort of... Uh, sort of personnel challenges, you've got to find the right people. Indeed, indeed, and, and I've been really fortunate in that. When you 
tell people, oh, would you like to come and do field work in Hawaii? They have these images of strolling along the beach with a Mai Tai and a net, <laughs> and uh, they must be sorely disappointed when uh, they get to the reality here. Uh, but if you find the right people, and, and I have had the great fortune to work with a lot of really good uh, folks in my lab and in my department at the university and also in the agencies, uh, it's tremendous and it's a lot of fun. But uh, yeah, you're, you're in some pretty hazardous terrain. What you hit some very steep, muddy uh, places. Uh, very difficult to get into. Sometimes we have to take helicopters and uh, then uh, slog through a pretty wet uh, forest to get to these last pristine places where we're going to find uh, native species holding on. And, and that's actually part of the problem. One of the challenges is really uh, how do we find the remaining species? Because Hawaii has suffered massive extinction, worse than any other state in, in the nation and probably one of the extinction capitals in the world, uh, which is not something we really want to be proud of. Right, right. No, certainly not. And uh, it's something we all should be, be trying to do our best. Uh, that's why I thought to work with the Kamehameha Butterflies certainly worth noting and, and applauding and trying you, to get you, the public yeah. involved in. Absolutely. Uh, but um, There's so many more things like that the public could help with, I think, uh, planting native more. plants, um, <laughs> supporting uh, the preservation of, of native uh, forest areas, uh, excluding uh, the invasive ungulates, you know, things like pigs and goats and deer and cows even on Big Island uh, go into areas where the native plants were and utterly destroy them. And that's happened over most of the state. There are still pockets where we have native vegetation and the native insects that rely on that, but we just need more uh, help with preserving the little spots that are left. Right, because once the, if the native vegetation goes, then unless your insect is sort of a generalist, the yeah. insect that relies on native vegetation also goes. And, and we've lost a lot of insects yeah. that way, yeah. lots and lots and lots. In fact, there's an interesting story about a flightless fly that was discovered uh, by a, a famous entomologist, Perkins, over, over 100 years ago, just on Tantalus, up here outside of Honolulu. And uh, it was hopping around. It didn't need to fly. You know, it just hopped and crawled in the, in the, in the leaf litter. And uh, the sad thing is he came back a few years later and they were utterly extinct. The species was gone. And in that case, it was probably because of invasive vegetation coming in and ants arriving uh, and just cleaned out the entire area. Huh. So it's, it's kind of sad, a, a sad story, yeah. but it's indicative of, of these crazy things that happen in Hawaii, but also how fragile they are. Yeah, yeah that's true. It, if, uh, they can be, if a species can be wiped out that quickly, uh, right. a, a flightless fly, I mean, that's a paradox. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> how how would you know it was a fly? <laughs> <laughs> that's the trick of being an entomologist. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you have to recognize a fly even without its wings. <laughs> Excellent. So, okay, so we, you've got these scientific and sort of technological challenges. You have the, the sort of the, the personnel challenges and, and, and all this. There must be other sorts of challenges like funding and, uh, and, yeah. and, and support. That's, that. that's true in all of science. Right. I, I think that's a, a cross we all bear is just uh, the funding rates have become uh, increasingly low. Uh, so uh, my advisor might have had a funding rate at the National Science Foundation of 20 or 30 percent, and now it's 7 percent. And so what that means is that everybody who's trying to do work is finding it harder and harder to get the money, and we have to do more with less. We have to spend more and more of our time, our free time, you know, weekends, whatever it is, trying to get this work done because we simply don't have enough money to get the results that we need. Um, so I wish there were more funding for science. It's proportionately declined tremendously over the years, and, and that is a shame. Uh, but I, I think maybe that's in part something we can help with by going on shows like this and, and letting people know what the science is for, why it's worth supporting. Yeah, ab absolutely, and, uh, and I, certainly, I certainly hear you. I work in the, more in the area of education, but we have the, exactly the same thing. These funding rates have dropped now, yeah, as you say, below 10%, which just means it's extraordinarily difficult. You've got huge competition for every dollar that's available. Uh, it's, you can spend inordinate amounts of time years writing writing grant proposals to try to get the money in. right years and yeah. years it, it to, to work on the hypothesis I was talking about it took five years of annually working on this massive grant and submitting it and having it rejected and rejected and rejected and improving and, and doing as much of the work before and as we could to show them that it was really possible before we finally got the money wow. Wow. and it was only three years of funding so <laughs> and then we're back in the in the mill trying to do it again that's one of the biggest challenges in science I think Wow, yeah, yeah, excellent. So let, let's take a look a little bit, if, if, we, if, we, if we've exhausted the challenges, <laughs> uh, let's, let's look at the future. So 
where is where is your work going? What, what, what do you hope to accomplish? How will you sort of know when you get there? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think there's never an end, actually. And that's one of the good things about it, and perhaps one of the most challenging things about it, is uh, it's like following uh, a trail that winds and, and goes in directions you never expect. And it's wonderful on the way, but you have to understand you may not have a pot of gold at the end or, or a magical, neat conclusion. Uh, Hyposmacoma will continue for the rest of my career to baffle me. Um, it has baffled others for their careers. Uh, and I think that's something you have to accept and just enjoy the process and start making uh, sense of the contributions that you can on the way. The discovery of the carnivorous ones, the discovery of how diverse they are, the patterns of that diversity. You know, for example, with Hyposmacoma, we found that all of them are restricted to a single volcano. Not just a single island, but a single volcano on an island. So the Ko'olaus, their Hyposmacoma species are not shared even with the Waianais on the same island. Mm -hmm. And every island is like that. Um, that's an accomplishment. That's something that we have to derive satisfaction from, not to wait until we have this final end answer and the book is closed and we can move on. I don't think science operates that way. And so it ends up being a, a really fantastic journey, but it's not one that's going to end you know, neatly, I think. Right, you have, you have to be prepared to sort of enjoy the journey and not, not focus on it's the a very, destination. It's right. a very zen process. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. In, indeed. Which is not always easy. Right. So, uh, do you see this conservation movement, particularly insect conservation, as a, as a growing field? Are you a, a, do you consider yourself a, a pioneer in the field? Uh, are, are there others joining this, this kind of work and, and getting involved? You mentioned some collaborators before. Right, right. I would say uh, certainly I'm not a pioneer. I'm a follower. Uh, this is something that's been brought up repeatedly for probably over 100 years in different places by different people. I'd like to think it's getting more traction now that people are starting to understand it's important. We're not trying to save the cockroaches in your closet, the ants in your garbage. Uh, what we're trying to save are the endemic butterflies, uh, the, the last remaining examples of what has made Hawaii so special in an evolutionary sense. Because if we lose those, we lose these incredible stories that were 15 million, 10 million years in the making, and we never even knew what happened. You know? And lots of those things happened uh, when, when people arrived and, and things that we brought with us, ants, uh, wasps, uh, rats, pigs. Those kinds of things, uh, those kinds of animals have destroyed a lot of the stories that Hawaii used to hold. And there are still some that are left, like Hyposmacoma with the snail eaters and the aquatic ones. But there are many other stories out there that are waiting to be discovered, and I hope we can get to them before they disappear. Well, that's, that's excellent. I, I have enjoyed talking with you here, and you, you've been telling some great stories and, and really uh, both entertaining and enlightening uh, our, our viewers here, I think. It has been my distinct pleasure. <laughs> Thank you for having me. So uh, I'll, call, I'll call it a day here. Uh, again, you're, we're on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. My guest today has, has been Dan Rubinoff from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Aloha, Dan. Aloha. <laughs>